I will just mute you if you uh, welcome to the third Q&A, the third Q&A of the Darwin 200 Global Voyage. Uh, we will just start uh, just like the other two times with a quick introduction about, uh, well, the team. And then we will uh, give a short presentation about uh, the ship, the life on board, and about the project itself. And then there will be uh, plenty of time left for you to ask uh, everything you would like to know. Uh, well, I'm Matthias. I'm uh, well, basically the newest member of the shipping company Astus Geldes team. Um, I've made my first voyage uh, when I was, uh, well, not yet born in my mother's uh, belly. And from then on, uh, from ever then on, I've been sailing on the Astus Gelde and the Helena, our other ship, uh, well, almost every year. I'm Gerben's son, and it is uh, truly a pleasure to be involved in uh, such a great project, such a great adventurous uh, circumnavigation. And so, well, if you have any questions about your booking or if, uh, well, you're getting invoiced, uh, it's most uh, likely to, uh, well, receive an email from me or uh, Elvira, who is uh, not able to join us today. And I would like to give the word to, uh, well, my father, Gerben. <laughs> Okay. I, uh, no, thank you, Matthias. <laughs> um, well, uh, obviously, I'm uh, Gerben. I'm um, managing director of the company, and I'm also the one of the captains of uh, Oosterschelde. I've just been sailing her uh, in Cape Verde. Um, I'm back here now for two weeks, two and a half weeks, I think. Um, <clears throat> And I, uh, I have to admit, I don't sail that much anymore. Um, I'm often in the office, uh, busy with the maintenance of the ship, planning of the ship, uh, of course, with the crewing, uh, but I still do. And um, today I want to tell you something about the, the, how life on board a, a tall ship is. Some of you I already know, some of you I know that have been, uh, have been uh, uh, on board or, or have uh, attended other uh, Q&A sessions. Um, so, but I will, uh, let's say, go for the, the more practical uh, uh, part of the Darwin 200 voyage. And uh, I'm happy to, to give the word to uh, Stu to tell you more about the project uh, itself. Thank you so much, Gavin. That was an absolute pleasure. Um, well, my name is Stuart McPherson. I'm the project leader of Darwin 200. And it's an absolute honor to be working with Gervin and his, his wonderful team and Matthias and their, their wonderful team. Um, if it's okay tonight, we'll, we're going to have a format where I'll give a short overview of the project just so everyone knows the context and why we're doing this. Then I'll hand over to, to Gervin, who as he, as he mentioned is very kindly going to um, give an overview of life on board. And then we've actually prepared a short presentation to showcase legs one to eight. Each Q&A session will be doing another eight legs. So next one, it'll be nine to 16, obviously the one after that, um, and the one after that to get to 32, our total. So, okay, if it's all right with everyone, um, we'll start with a bit of an overview of the project so you can understand the context and why we're doing this global voyage. Um, I'll just share my screen and hopefully, Matthias, can you nod if you can see that? Is that okay? Beautiful, wonderful. I cannot see it yet, only that you have started. I can oh. see it now. Yeah, we can see it. You see it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Okie dokie. All right. I'll just maximize it. There we go. And there. Okay. All righty. So the project is called Darwin 200, as you Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I think my Zoom crashed. Can you see me again now? Beautiful. Okay, all righty. So I'll just share my screen. Perfect. Sorry about that. There we go. Back into the presentation. Um, Matthias, not if you can see that. Okay, lovely. Okay, so um, the project is called Darwin 200. And basically what we're trying to do is help bring conservation and environmental sciences to a new generation of young scientists and young people across the globe. The project has got three main objectives. The first objective is that we're going to be training the world's very best young conservationists. We're going to be bringing 200 
one from each of 200 countries and states around the world, to the ports where Charles Darwin made landfall. So to be clear, these young people will not be sailing around the world, they're coming to the ports to study the animals and the plants which Darwin undertook. We've, we've got a very focused and developed program um, which will be partnering them with NGOs in these different locations around the world. And they'll be undertaking a range of different projects uh, to help train and hone their skills to then take back to their home countries um, for the next, or well, for the rest of their careers. The next part is to create the world's most exciting classroom. Our goal is to engage millions of students across the world through a non-stop platform of activities and outreach um, as the ship goes around the world. We'll be talking more about these in a second. And last but not least, and this, this last element is deliberately a little bit vague at this point, we're finalizing an agreement to bring on 64 PhD students, two on each leg, and to do some really exciting research in each of the locations that we go to. We're incredibly honored beyond words to have three amazing patrons um, and supporters. Uh, you, you may know of them, uh, Dr. Jane Goodall, who's famed around the world for her, her pioneering work on, on chimpanzees and, and conservation across the globe. Um, the equally wonderful Dr. Sylvia Earle, who's pretty much the most famous marine biologist alive today. And last, but by no means least, uh, the wonderful Dr. Sarah Darwin, who's actually one of Charles Darwin's direct descendants. She's Charles's great, great, great granddaughter um, and is, has been very much involved in, in the natural history scene, particularly in Germany and in Berlin in recent years. Well, as you may know, uh, we've developed um, this global voyage. It consists of 32 voyage legs, so 32 sections of the voyage. Now, we have adjusted it a little bit. It's intended to be faithful to Darwin's voyage, and we go to every single lo major location that Darwin made land for, but we have simplified it. The Beagle, which is Charles Darwin's ship, actually went north and south multiple times along the east coast of South America. We're just doing that once. Um, we've also added in some additional locations that Darwin did not visit. Um, for example, Easter Island, um, or Fiji and Rarotonga and so forth. Um, these are basically just to, to make the transit across the Pacific even more interesting. It's, it's almost a crime to sail past Easter Island without visiting. So we had to add, add a few extra locations in. And there is one significant difference. We're, we're crossing, after the Beagle left Australia, it actually crossed the Indian Ocean, stopping only in Kirkus Keeling very briefly in Mauritius. We're actually doing it uh, under South America just for logistical reasons and simplicity. So, but other than that, those small changes, we're, we're very faithful to the Beagle voyage and we've done every, we're visiting every major port that Darwin made landfall at. As you may know, the voyage of the Beagle was quite simply the greatest natural history adventure of all time. Darwin's um, journey around the world. You've got to remember, Darwin was only 22 when he started this. It took Darwin five years to get around the world. Obviously, it's taking us two. Um, but um, yeah, Darwin, most people remember Darwin as an old man with a beard, but he was a young Indiana Jones type explorer when he undertook this, this incredible voyage and did everything from climbing mountains to going out with the gauchos um, to surviving earthquakes to you name it. He was a real adventurer. And so we're hoping those that take part in the global voyage will share some of those amazing experiences and see some of these incredible locations through Darwin's eyes. Well, just to explain those three objectives in just a little bit more detail. So um, in terms of those young people, so what we're doing is selecting the very best of them. These are not normal young people. These aren't people that are just interested in conservation. These are people that have already gone and done incredible things. People that have gone and already changed the world at a young age. Um, for example, there's one example I'll just give you of, of one of these. Uh, an 18 year old whom we've already selected um, at the age of 18 raised 30,000 pounds here in the UK which is about just under 40,000 euros, completely off his own back, bought an area of degraded habitat, degraded peat bog, um, burnt off the non-native plants and actually rehabilitated an ecosystem and reintroduced native plants and built that, that original native ecosystem. So we're looking for people that have that flame burning inside of them to change the world and make things better. 
So those young people are called Darwin leaders. Um, we want them, they're, they're, the goal is they'll be 18 to 25 when they take part. And we want them then to go back to their home countries with the skills that they need to help make the world better for the next 50 years over the course of their careers. We want to train them to become the elite conservation leaders in the world of tomorrow. That's basically uh, their role. The second objective, the world's most exciting classroom, um, is really, really fun. So as the ship goes around the world, we're going to be beaming out lectures, question and answer sessions, experiments, research activities, weekly documentaries, projects with Sylvia, Jane and Sarah. The idea is to hopefully engage millions and millions of people every single week. And I already do a lot of this already. We can absolutely achieve this, it's absolutely doable. Um, to beam live into schools around the globe. And we've already got some really cool projects and prizes, including a philanthropist that will pay for the winning, the, the, the class of students at the winning school of the competition. Their, that class and their teachers will meet, meet us in the Galapagos to do experiments on land. So we've got some really exciting projects and competitions that we're gonna be beaming out during the global voyage, solely with the purpose of, of engaging young people. And it's completely free. It's completely open to schools across the globe, from Papua New Guinea to Canada to everywhere in between. Um, we did two test voyages um, in 2020 and 2021 and worked with a wonderful group called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, uh, which beam out um, lectures live by satellite. Um, and we did several of these um, during the test voyages, including on Bass Rock off Scotland which is home to the world's largest colony of, of gannets, um, about 110,000 pairs. And it's really cool. You can beam live to the schools. The kids can ask questions and then you can literally show them in real time. So that's what we're going to hopefully be doing as much as possible throughout the voyage and hopefully getting schools engaged right the way around the planet. The last but not least objective is um, the research activities. Again, we're deliberately leaving this a little bit vague while we consolidate the other elements, but basically we've got five key research areas uh, from a coral reef survey, a habitat survey, a global plastic slash garbology trawl around the world, and a whale and dolphin survey, and a, a project looking at solutions to, to some of the world's pollution problems. So that, that's what we're hoping to undertake. And last but not least, in our Darwin 200 budget, we're going to offset or double offset the carbon generated from the project by recreating, planting and helping to recreate some of the Atlantic rainforest, the beautiful coastal rainforests of Brazil, which Darwin saw and was in absolute awe of, but about 95% since been destroyed. So we'll, we'll be helping replant some of that as a result of this project. So um, that's a little overview of Darwin 200. Um, what we have done so far is that two test voyages, as I mentioned, and now we're preparing in earnest for the, the global voyage starting next August, in August 2023. We really, really hope that you can join this amazing adventure. This is one of the photos of one of the test voyages and some of the young scientists in, at work. And so from our side, it's an honor and a privilege to be working with Gerben and Matthias and the beautiful tour ship Osterskilde. So um, we really, really hope you'll join one of the sailing legs and sail between these amazing ports and see some of these incredible parts of the world for yourself. So I'll hand over to De Gerber now, and um, thank you very, very much for listening to my overview of Darwin 200. All righty. Okay, I will first, so uh, this is not uh, my, uh, Michael, how do you say? I'm a captain, eh? so I will do share screen. And let me see this works so far. Yes. That's good. Okay. Well, I um, um you have um you have heard uh, um Stu about the project, and in the the, the previous uh, Q and A sessions we talked about the history of the ship. Of course, Oosterschelde is is a uh, a beautiful vessel, as as uh, Stu mentioned. It's also a historical vessel, and uh, actually we uh, the shipping company is there to make sure that this uh, ship still, still sails the ocean uh, in 100 years. 
Um, having said that, um, we have to, uh, to, to, to sail uh, to earn a living. And uh, this project is, 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 um, is, is a way to do it because if you want to do it, uh, you better do it nice. Um, you will be uh, perhaps joining one of the legs of the Darwin 200 uh, voyage. And uh, although um, Stu told you a lot about the project on land, what we actually sell is a project at sea. You will be joining this uh, ship as a crew member. And, and of course, we, we, we hope and we think you should stay a little bit on uh, a few days or weeks on land before you join the ship. And of course, after you leave the ship, do it again, because at sea, you won't see any of these beautiful birds or rainforests. Uh, you have to stay on land to see that. But at sea, we have other things to, uh, to, to share. Um, what we do with this uh, historical ship is actually invite you to be uh, one of our uh, crew members. Um, you're not a, a guest. You're not booking a trip on a, on a, <clears throat> on an, uh, how you say that, cruise uh, uh, ship uh, where you uh, are being served in your room. No, the rooms are pretty small. Uh, there's a comfortable uh, bed, but uh, as soon as you're out of your bed, we, uh, we, we like you to go up and help us. For example, like this here in the in the bowsprit of the ship, um, you see this ship. It's a, it's a big sailing ship, but at the ocean, it's only a small one, and uh, it has uh, it carries a, a lot of sail, a uh, big mast. It's all old fashioned. It's a historical ship, so we need your power as well to help us. Not necessarily up in the yards as these people do. Uh, you are invited to do. We will teach you how to do it, and it is uh, quite. Uh, uh, it is actually fun to work here. But if you don't uh, want to do it, there's plenty of work on the decks, in the bowsprit, or even in the wheelhouse where you can, um, where you can, uh, let's say, help us navigating, um, or here, like on the foredeck, uh, uh, adjusting the sails. Um, so that's part of your voyage. You will be uh, appointed into a watch. Um, the watch system is normally one watch on and then two watch off, so you have plenty of time to sleep and eat and, and, and um, uh, well, whatever you want to do to, to spend your time, uh, read a book or, or uh, write your diary, but also be on deck and help us um, adjust in sales, be a, a sailor as we all are uh, during these uh, voyages. Um, it's a... Uh, it's uh, hopefully we got some young people on board uh, as well as uh, elderly people. Um, you can join by what I said, climbing in the rigging, but you can also be on the wheel. Um, we're always outside. This is nice weather, but uh, the ship should be steered. So we have watches about 20 minutes. You're on the wheel and then the next one takes over from you. This girl uh, wanted to help us with the general maintenance because as soon as we drop anchor, um, the painting starts, I uh, would say. And you're all happy to, to, to help us with that. A ship is never finished. Um, but of course, you uh, travel a ship, you travel with a ship uh, to explore the, 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 the area where you are. And sometimes it's uh, maybe a long ocean crossing where your uh, rhythm is, um, let's say, um, 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 how you say, predicted by the sea, your watches, um, the, the, the sunrise, the sun uh, uh, set, uh, the moon, the, the stars, you can learn to navigate with them. Um, uh, the progress we make, the, 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 the weather systems that we have to um, uh, work with. But as soon as we come to closer to land, of course, we will try to uh, show you uh, as much as we can from the land. And what I said, after you leave the ship or before you come on the ship, Please do enjoy the beautiful, beautiful places where we uh, will land with the ship, like here, or uh, like here, or like here. Uh, all these places. Um, as I said, there's room for everybody on board. Um, you don't need to be, uh, uh, um, let's say, a 22 year uh, there uh, uh, all to, to, to join a, a vessel. Uh, you see here elderly people as well uh, helping us out. Uh, the only thing we, uh, we want from you is that you're relatively fit. Um, we are sometimes on, a, on, a, on a, a stretch far away from everything and always people think, ah, oh, you send a helicopter if something happens. Well, a helicopter uh, um, can reach maybe uh, uh, 250 miles and then the other 250 back. That's about it. So after uh, two days we left shore, uh, we are out of reach of everything. Um, Having said that, uh, luckily, uh, 
most people uh, are aware of that and most people um, um, behave, um, well, how you say, wise on the boat. This is a crossing of the, of the Atlantic. Uh, people say, aren't you bored crossing a sea and there's only water around you, but uh, I can tell you, you're never bored. But of course, if you reach a, uh, here, this is a picture of London long ago, but if you reach wow. a country where you, um, where you actually enter with your ship, um, a, a big port, if we reach New Zealand, if we reach uh, uh, um, Australia, if we do reach Rio de Janeiro, or if we do reach all these um, special places where, where, where we will be landing, that's of course a special moment as well. Um, Cape Horn, it's uh, in this, uh, Darwin didn't do it like that, but uh, we do it, we come back from New Zealand around Cape Horn up to um, the Falkland Islands and um, other uh, destinations like this. Live on board, well, here the ship is set up for a, for a little event, for a little, uh, I don't know, some, some, some party. Um, but uh, this is the place where we live. Upstairs there, you have some room to, to, to watch a television or to read a book or to listen to the music. Um, on these tables, you can always find a place to sit or read or uh, um, uh, talk together or play cards. So this is the cabins where you sleep. We have bunks on top of each other, as you see, uh, not too big, but quite comfortable. They all have a hatch to the deck, so you have uh, fresh air all the time. And uh, what I said, uh, this is how we, we spend the evenings together, if we can, eating together on these long tables. And after that, we go back to our watches um, and uh, resume uh, uh, what we are doing. Um, this is about uh, um, being a sailor on board the ship. It's not always that uh, nice, of course. You can have uh, days of rain. You can have days of, of bad weather. But the whole thing of traveling with the sailing ship is actually that you achieve something. It, it is not easy to get from A to B. And once you've done it with these, with these sails, with your hands, with your muscle power, with your, with your team all together, and you arrive to the destination, um, it feels well it's 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 you can't compare it with flying somewhere and being spit out a plane in another uh, this this you have to achieve yourself and uh, well this is what we will be uh, doing during all these uh, 32 uh, lakhs of uh, darwin 200 this is about my um stop share this is about what i wanted to sell tell you a little bit and uh, I hope we get some questions uh, after these uh, these pictures and after this uh, little uh, speech. If you have any questions, you can just ask them in the chat function or you can raise your hand with a function on your screen. I believe it's somewhere down in the lower row. I'm not sure. Well, you can ask them anyway. You can just so we are not with with too many people so you can just unmute yourself but i believe Stu want to give an overview or the, of the first six legs right yep that's it perfect um hopefully you can can you see that okay beautiful wonderful okay okay well so what i've prepared is a, an overview of the first one to eight legs one to eight um as Gerben so, so wonderfully explained there, the adventure really is uh, being on board this incredible vessel. And as, as Gerben said, you will never be bored for a moment. There's so much to see, um, so much to experience while you're on board and, and every day is different. And even bad weather days are fascinating in, in many different ways, um, from the weather to the wildlife, um, to the clouds and, and, and everything. So, um, so the adventure really is the vessel and the, the, the adventure on the legs is sailing between obviously two ports. But the objective of my talk now very quickly is to show you some of the things that you can do before and after in the ports, um, which hopefully might help you select which legs you want to join. This is of course by no means com complete. I prepared about five or six or seven slides for each location, but, um, but hopefully this, this, is, this gives you a bit of the flavor of the locations you can choose from and what you can see in the ports before and after because many of the questions we receive by email is is about that what they can what people can do before and after and which leg people can choose so um let's say for each of the next question and answer sessions we'll do another eight legs uh, in sequence um over the over the next few months 
Okay, so the first leg, as you may be aware, we're, we're following Charles Darwin's journey. Um, Darwin left Plymouth in England, and um, we're leaving on the 14th of, of August, 2023, reaching Tenerife on the 26th. So um, we have a little departure party planned, which all participants are invited to, uh, not just the ones on leg one, we will plan it so that all, all participants that, that wish to join can, can join and see the ship off. But of course, especially the ones on, on leg one leaving the next day. So um, Plymouth is a very nice, interesting town in the, the south of England. It's very historic um, and, and very, very interesting. And you can go to the exact berth, the exact docks uh, where Darwin left from. There's a, a pool nearby where, where the beagle was anchored. And there's a plaque showing you exactly where, where the ship left from. So um, we start that on the 14th of August, um, uh, 2023. Darwin left on the 27th of December, 1831. He, he wrote, wrote in his journal how much excitement and trepidation he had uh, beginning this great voyage. Because remember, when they did it, they had no idea really accurately how long it would, it would last or how long it would take. I think it was originally planned to be three years, but it went to five. Well, sailing south from England, the waters are, are very, very famous for, um, for common dolphins, shown here, and also harbour porpoises and some bottlenose dolphins and even sunfish. Um, I went around the UK twice last year and the year before, and we saw great aggregations of sunfish as well. So there's a lot to see in the waters as you go south. When you reach the beautiful Canary Islands, um, you can do something which Darwin could not do. When Darwin reached Tenerife, there was actually a quarantine, ironically, for today's day, today's day and age. <laughs> um, but poor old Darwin saw, because remember, he had never left England by this point, and he was desperate to get ashore and explore. But he could see the Canary Islands, he could see Tenerife, but they weren't allowed to land. So it really broke poor old Darwin's heart a bit because he could see this fascinating landscape. So those that choose leg one will, will end up in the Canary Islands, in Tenerife and as I'm sure as you're aware it's one of one of the prime tourist destinations in in Europe it's a fascinating archipelago home to spectacular scenery and really interesting um really interesting plant life in in ecology in a way it's comparable to the Galapagos in some senses in the sense that it's young volcanic islands or young islands of volcanic origin I should say with with a lot of endemic wildlife not least the spectacular Dracinia, the, the dragon's blood trees. These trees have blood red sap. Um, the sap was traded right across the Middle East to Arabia and beyond um, for alchemy over the last few thousand years. And these trees can be hundreds, possibly thousands of years old. And you'll see quite a few of them um, as you explore the archipelago. And of course, it's a paradise for, for bird life and um, nature enthusiasts and just extraordinary volcanic landscapes, um, landscapes consisting of volcanic ash. So a really diverse place. Leg two um, sails from, from the Canary Islands to Cape Verde, as you may be aware from the, the, the brochures and the documents. We leave on the 3rd of September, 2023, um, reaching well, just over a week later at Cape Verde. Um, Darwin was in, this was the first place Darwin could get off Beagle. And he actually found an octopus in a rock pool um, very soon after reaching and writes very enthusiastically just in complete awe and amazement at, um, at the wildlife that he saw. Just as a side note, if, if anyone's interested, at this point Darwin was a dropout from university. He'd failed, he'd been, he'd been dropped out of university twice. Everyone thought he was a failure. Um, he was destined to be a, a country parson in the church when he got back. And so at this point in the voyage, he, he describes what he sees through, from the Bible uh, and, and in religious terms. It's fascinating to see how he evolves as a person from literally a dropout failure from university. He went to medicine, medical school and failed and, and quit it um, twice um, and then became the world's greatest scientist by the end of the voyage. Anyway, um, at Cape Verde, of course, you, you've got spectacular beaches, amazing trekking, a lot of wonderful opportunities to snorkel and, and see marine life um, around the islands. And these are some photos that Gavin very kindly shared of a previous visit a few years ago. So it's a, a fascinating part of the world. 
Um, you'll be forgiven if you don't know of the next archipelago. It, it's relatively little known. Fernando de Naranja. Um, it, it, very few people know of it. This leg involves, of course, crossing uh, the equator. So those of you who have not crossed the equator yet um, might have a run in with Neptune and certain traditions on board, um, which I better not say anything more about. Um, but anyway, for those that want to, you'll, you'll get down to Fernando de Naranja. And um, uh, we, of course, this, this leg takes just over 10 days. We leave on September the 20th and arrive on the first day of, of October. Um, it, just to explain, there are flights connecting to and from Fernando de Naranja. So you can easily fly from here at the end of this leg if you want to go home after this point. Or if you're joining for leg four, you can easily access the archipelago from mainland Brazil. So there's mainland flights connecting back to the mainland at one stop. These islands are often called Bra Brazil's treasure islands. They're absolutely exquisite and beautiful um, with really vibrant cultures and communities and fascinating little market towns with exotic fruits, but also really rich with wildlife. They're, they're famous for, I believe it's the third largest um, breeding colony of, of green turtles shown here and several other turtles, I think hawks bills as well. Um, and just terns, noddies, loads of seabirds. This is a, a juvenile mass booby. Um, and yeah, just a wonderful place to see wildlife and, and explore. Again, a great island for trekking that, that relatively few tourists go to. Most of the tourists that come here from Brazil, relatively few, um, yeah, relatively few from beyond, beyond Brazil go. So it's a real little gem. So if you're looking for an exciting leg to cross an ocean, to cross the Atlantic, for example, this, this could be a good one for you. Um, okay, the next leg is getting towards the coast of South America. Pretty exciting leg. Um, so from Fernando de Naranja, we sail to, to Salvador on the coast of Brazil. So this, this leg takes a little longer. Um, we leave on the 9th um, of October and reach on the 17th. And um, here's a shot from, again, which Gerpen very kindly showed, uh, shared of the previous voyages. And of course, reaching that, that, that moment of reaching Brazil will be so exciting after sailing out you know, from, from the islands, crossing the waters, and finally seeing that smudge on the horizon that grows into the coast, and then eventually to, to Salvador. It'll be so exciting. Um, Darwin, of course, landed here. When he landed, it was actually carnival, and he had never seen anything like this. He'd, he'd grown up, of course, in boring gray England, and just was blown away by the, the tropics, the the colourful cultures, the people. Um, he was in absolute awe of the place um, and, and had an exciting time exploring. And to some extent, the UNESCO World Heritage Centre of Salvador, to some extent, really isn't that much changed from Darwin's visit. So you can have an explore here and see some of the colours. And of course, nearby, on land, um, nearby, you can see the Atlantic rainforests, those beautiful forests that I was talking about earlier. That have been largely destroyed since Darwin's visit. Um, home to some incredible animals like the, the golden tamarind and lots of different aracaras and toucans and beautiful bird life and talansia air plants and all kinds of great great plants and animals. Well leg five we start going south down the coast of South America. We sail from Salvador to Rio um, which of course is definitely one of the highlights as Gerben was, was saying. We're hugging the coastline on this voyage, so um, on this voyage leg. So this could be a good one for anyone that isn't particularly too keen on open oceans or wanting perhaps a, yeah, to, to, to be close to shore. Um, of course, the coastline of this part of Brazil is, is famous for its beauty and its incredible dramatic cliff lines and beaches. So um, this is, yeah, this is an exciting leg in that sense and just over a week, so relatively, short and interesting leg and of course reaching Rio will definitely be one of the highlights of the global voyage for such an iconic epic town as Rio. When Darwin visited it was a relatively small port it's amazing how much can change in in 200 years but of course yeah you'll be able to then explore Rio at the end of this leg and we we thoroughly thoroughly recommend uh, adding a few days extra after you leave the ship to explore this amazing city and all that it offers from Coca Cabana Beach to obviously Sugarloaf and, and all of the sites 
uh, in between. And there's some interesting ruins and historic sites that, again, haven't changed since Darwin was there. So you, you can explore. And obviously, we're in really lush rainforest environments around here. So you'll be able to see a great, great range of, of wildlife uh, nearby. Well, leg six, we start sailing south um, down to Uruguay. And we, we end in, in the capital, Montevideo. Um, Uruguay obviously is, is a less well-known country in, in South America, which is a bit unfair because it's one of the most interesting of all. It's got so much, so, so, so much to offer. So this is a good leg. Um, again, another coastal leg hugging the coast or relatively, relatively close to the coast, lasting just over 10 days. And um, yeah, you'll reach Montevideo, which is such a vibrant town, full of architecture, full of history, full of interesting museums. And again, it's one of those places that many people kind of overlook going to South America, but nearby they've got really interesting wildlife from armadillos to capybaras and all sorts of interesting animals. So definitely, definitely worth visiting. The leg seven is the shortest of the entire voyage. It's actually just over 24 hours. So it's only a very short leg, but we cross the Rio de la Plata across to Buenos Aires. So if you've got friends or families that, that aren't necessarily keen on sailing, but just want to experience what it's like on board or a very short voyage, this is the perfect leg for you guys, because yeah, you overnight basically on the vessel um, and reach, you travel between two of the most interesting cities uh, in South America, and then yeah, reach Buenos Aires the next day. So this is a really good one if you've got children or, 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 or perhaps a partner that doesn't particularly like sailing, but just wants to experience a little bit, it's a really good um, trip. And obviously, Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires is, is such a historic and interesting city um, and such an interesting town. Darwin, not far, well, not too far from Buenos Aires, met the General Rosas in the Pampa um, on his way to Buenos Aires. So Darwin went here, but it, it would have been a very different city when, when, when Darwin landed here. Leg eight, the last leg that we're going to talk about today, um, is now heading really south. We, we, we leave Buenos Aires and sail along the coast, along the, the region of the Pampa, the giant grasses, into Patagonia proper. And we reach this extraordinary landscape. This is yeah, a reasonably long leg. It's, it's roughly two weeks. And um, the coastline is epic. We go past Bahia Blanca, the White Bay, this immense bay. Um, and just beautiful beaches. And of course, as we get further south, the landscape gets more and more dramatic. The Patagonia itself, obviously, as you, you may know, is a grassland landscape um, with guanacos, which is a relative of a llama, and caracaras, caracaras, sorry, a bird of prey, and various other, various other animals. But this is getting more dramatic as we go south. Darwin spent a lot of time here because Captain Fitzroy was actually surveying this part of the coast for the British Admiralty. And um, Darwin spent a lot of time inland um, exploring different parts of Patagonia, often with the gauchos, the South American cowboys. And there's this very romantic life of, of um, herding, herding the, the, the cattle, herding the, the horses as well, and living off the land, which, which Darwin did. So if anyone stays here, stays longer um, in Patagonia after this leg, you can savour some of that experiences and, and see the rear and just the, the beauty of these landscapes. It's dramatic, it's barren, but it's beautiful. Um, so yeah, if you, if you join leg eight, this is what you'll, you'll end up with at, when, you, when you leave the ship at the end of this voyage leg. So we warmly welcome you to sign up um, and choose a leg. Um, they're all interesting for different reasons. Um, and please join the next question and answer sessions where we'll be overviewing legs nine to 16. So hopefully this has given you a few more ideas about which leg might be right for you. So um, I think now we're hand over to questions and answers. So back to Matthias. <laughs> yeah, well, we haven't received any questions via email. Oh. So yeah, well, probably uh, you have explained uh, a lot but i have a question for you last time we introduced the community page and uh well elvira and i have been really busy with editing everything and uh well inviting everyone we have to do that uh 
well, manually. Um, but I was wondering, some of you um, I see are already a part of it, but what would you like uh, us to share there? Uh, what, uh, when we are getting closer to a particular voyage, of course, we will share uh, in important uh, joining uh, instructions. We will try to share uh, messages uh, we receive from the ship where it is uh, currently. But yeah, perhaps you have a su suggestion about what uh, we could, uh, we would, um, we can share there, because we want to, well to to get it a bit. Uh, on its feet now. <laughs> Does anyone have any ideas? I mean, we're, we're going well, to be... the idea on? about the idea about this uh, community, online community, not not this one, not this session, but the one on our website was that people that actually uh, um, choose to to book a, a a voyage, they 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 want to help each other. I just saw when you were talking about Fran, Fernando de Noronha, I saw a Carter saying, "Hey, I've been there. It's absolutely oh. beautiful," and um, so Carter could help other people that are interested in in going there. Okay, this is how I did it, or this uh, this is the well, and and so that is actually the the main reason that we set up this this community uh, uh, page on our yeah, it's it's like a facebook but uh, very small and just for 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 all of us um, and the idea was that we can help uh, each other with the information that we have uh, closer to the um, <clears throat> voyage it could also be information like oh hey i find a nice hotel here or hey this is uh, i find a cheap flight or or i leave the ship here and uh, i leave my gumboots somebody interested i mean anything like that but um please come up if you have questions if you have ideas please let us know because this is all new for us we have to learn from you from the users so that's uh, that's matthias question i think yeah uh well another question uh, uh Herwin, you perhaps uh, can answer uh, do you have lee cloth on bats from carter Sorry, I didn't uh, get the question. It's if we have Lee clothes on okay. beds. What I mean is that, you know, on your beds, you have a, when we get into the stormier seas and the bed starts tilting, do you have a Lee cloth? So yeah. if you roll into it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is a Lee cloth, but normally I recommend take your, uh, take your, um, um, life jacket and put it under your mattress and make a nice little yeah. boat of your mattress and you know, you'll be uh, much more comfortable. But we do have leak cloths that you can hook up to a, a hook on the, on the ceiling. Yes, we I, do. I sailed, I sailed in one boat that had one, but then another boat, you guys probably all know Heiss from Tecla. He doesn't have them. I fell, uh -huh. on, I fell, I fell on my brother twice from the top bunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, what, what I said, there's, there's many ways to, to, to come out of your bed. And uh, some of them uh, you should avoid, but so we do have them. <laughs> yes. Quick, quick question while I'm asking: Do you? Yeah. How do you guys on swimming off the boat in areas that you can? Well, I must admit that I did it, and I every time I did it, like like you know, you know, the first time I once ever did it, I was maybe uh, 19 or something, and I did it in the Gulf of Biscay, where you have some spots where it is uh, 5,600 meters deep, and I thought, oh, okay, let's let's make. But you don't you, you feel very uncomfortable for some reason i mean swimming in 10 meters is as dangerous as it is in 5000 meters but still it doesn't feel good to have five kilometers of water beneath you and um so as a captain i don't like it as a person <laughs> but as a captain i i don't like the idea <laughs> yeah think about it <laughs> Well, if the, the only the, the only uh, way to do it is if there is uh, absolutely perfect weather conditions, of course. Okay, and in that case, we can launch a dinghy. We can uh, be there as a rescue team uh, around it. But that can only be in very uh, beautiful conditions because as soon as there is a little wind, we'd like to sail. So, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Stu, perhaps you can answer this question from yeah. Bert. Uh, when should you arrange the trip to the starting point and from the end point? How long in advance? That's, that's a very, very good question. So um, as, as you may be able to see from our websites, um, we basically confirm and finalize the dates at the beginning of January 2023. 
The reason for that is there's a lot of adjustments that we have to make, of course, and we have to finalize the groups on each legs. So we recommend waiting for the confirmation at the start of January 2023 to then start proceeding. But obviously, particularly the last, the, the latter 10 legs that have been 2025, you, you, you don't necessarily need to start booking those flights or so forth, even into 2024. Um, so just to be clear, so we're, we're taking bookings now, we're fi finalizing the groups on each leg, then everything is confirmed and finalized at the end of this year. Then we come back to you in January, um, at which point, yeah, you can proceed and, and start taking out insurance policies and, and, and flights and so forth. Um, if it helps, um, especially following on from the point concerning the, um, the community, I'm actually going to be visiting every single location to set up the logistics for the Darwin 200 project in um, January and February and March 2023. So if there's anything I can help with, or for example, hotels or, or logistics, you know, if people need to know stuff on the ground, which, you know, might, isn't necessarily easy in some of the locations that we're going to, like Mangareva or um, Pitcairn or, sorry, or, or Falkland Islands and so forth, I can help with that on the ground. So, so send anything like that across and we'll start compiling lists for each of the ports. But to answer your question, book a place now. We solidify it over the next nine months. We then confirm it in January 2023 to proceed. Cool. Well, it's, uh, if I may interrupt, yeah. um, I think this is this this kind of information is also really good to share on this on yes. this community page. Yeah. Uh, if somebody has booked a flight or found a, a, a good way to get somewhere, or found that's that's nice to share because for some places we already have a lot of information and we will share that. Uh, but of course, some places are new to us as well. So uh, we have to find out by uh, yeah. gathering all these information from everybody, from including you. Yeah. So uh, yeah. please share it with, with us and with the rest of the group if you find something interesting. And uh, yeah. following on from that point, um, forgive me, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Taya Lucy um, has just asked about uh, advice concerning th exactly that point. So following on from Gerben's point, yes, absolutely will help, for example, Ty Lucy mentioned the Falkland Islands. So in that particular case, there are only two options, which are LAN, LAN uh, Chile and the RAF flights from Bryce Norton in, in England. So we'll definitely put that information online um, in the community pages. So yes, absolutely will help, um, especially with those difficult places, yeah. Yeah, and the shipping company from the shipping company, we will also uh, um, gather all this information, put it together and share it with you as well. The only problem for us as a shipping company is that if you get information from third parties, you never know if it's true or if it's still true after uh, uh, some time. So this kind of information has the, um, the habit to, to become old very quickly. So we have to always check it. And uh, so we, we are a bit, a bit um, how you say, careful with it. Because nothing worse than telling people, yes, that's no problem, and then find out that there is no flight anymore. So, yeah. um, but we will try to collect it all and share it with you all. But always keep in mind, check it. Check it yourself as well. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I see a question from Yinuk, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, Gerben, uh, would, uh, are we supplying live jackets? Well, supplying, uh, um, yeah, I don't know the word supplying, but um, we have them on board and you may use them, but you have to leave them on board when you leave the ship. But yes, we have them on board. And uh, from Jelle, uh, do you have the outfit for bad weather? I mean, a raincoat or uh, boots? No. Um, of course, there's always people that leave stuff behind, but you typically end up with uh, um, all left uh, shoes and all uh, uh, wrong uh, sizes. So um, we ask everybody to uh, bring its, uh, his or her own uh, uh, weather gear. But we give, uh, inf uh, how you say, recommendations on that. We sometimes see people carrying stuff that, um, well, that is really expensive, really heavy and, and um, really not necessary. Uh, so for every leg, we give an advice what to bring and what not to bring. All right, well, 
Does anyone have a question left? Oh, I think Angie does. Oh, yeah, I can unmute. You have to unmute yourself, Angie. Yeah, I, I just wondered how the schools get involved. Do you send out invitations to schools or do they have to apply for something? Yeah, so uh, forgive me, you're asking concerning the activities that we're going to be doing. But you say that there's going to be lots of people involved yep. in, with, around schools. Absolutely. So we're going to be relaunching our site as a complete portal, entirely set up for, for the education programme. We're calling it the world's most exciting classroom. So everything will be viewable and accessible through our website. Um, I, I'm, I believe you might be located in the UK. We're yep. also going to be sending out a resource box to, to schools across the UK throughout the voyage so, so yeah. you, you will send it to all schools will you we're certainly sending resources to all the schools yes. over the voyage but we're also engaging with them already um yeah but the the website itself will become a portal with all of these activities updated on a daily basis all right thank you yeah. pleasure thanks okay in in addition to that um I, yeah i'm working for uh biology journal in the Netherlands, uh, in fact, uh, which is a bi-weekly for biologists in the Netherlands. And uh, it has a lot of uh, subscribers who are working on schools, on bi biology teachers in schools. So I think I could be of help in making publicity or anything for your project or for, for this uh, classroom part of the, of the deal. So I, I just wonder what would be the most the best time to uh, to do this publicity it would be great to start start opening that discussion now um we're, we're starting to seriously plan the different activities everything we're doing in one or even two years in advance so it'd be it'd be great to start those discussions now if you'd okay. be so kind as to send an email to info at darwin200.com oh, i'll um I'll, I'll send a detailed up overview by by email and it'd be great to start that thank you very very much yeah I think that also will include maybe an interview with you, why you will uh, maybe on a later moment also. But, but be a pleasure, uh, absolute pleasure. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very very much. Thanks. Any other questions at all from anyone? Well, well, I still have a question. Also, oh. I have a question about the, this this role of the Darwin mentors. And yeah. Are they selected by you, or are they? Can you apply for being yes. a Darwin mentor, or? So, so we're opening up a program in July of this year. We're selecting, so each of the Darwin leaders will be accompanied by a Darwin mentor for three reasons. In some cases, they need to have a translator. So in, in some cases, the, the mentors, we have to select them from their home countries. But for the majority, that's not, that's not necessarily the, the case. So we're looking for people that have environmental skills or scientific skills that can help help basically guide the mentors um, and, and last of all, make sure that they do their research safely. Um, as an 18 year old, I was hanging off cliffs and climbing trees and, and all sorts. So there's the, the third element is safety as well. But yep, absolutely. We're opening that in January. Oh, sorry, in, sorry, in July. We're opening that up in July. And so if, if that's something you're interested in, absolutely would be would be terrific if, if you want to, to be part of that. And it will be in the on the in the ports, or it will be on the ships. Uh... Ports, yeah. Ports. All of the Darwin leader activities are in the ports, so that'll be in the ports. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions at all? I see Rosie's raising her hand. Uh, Did you have to unmute yourself? Well, I cannot do it. I can only ask you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> In, <laughs> thank you. In respect of the darling leaders that to apply, yep. you've got an age group. Well, uh, so is it eighteen or twenty-five? What? What? When is that dated from? So, because is yeah, it from look, the beginning of the of the voyage or so what we're, date? We're, they have to be eighteen. We're, we're actually it's deliberately a bit flexible. They have to be legal ah. adults. So they have they have to be eighteen and upwards, but we've already got some that might be twenty six, for example. So there's a bit of flexibility. Um, we're looking for them to be within that bracket when they join their placements. Obviously, the voyage is two years over three years, as in from twenty twenty right. to twenty twenty five. So inherently, there's a bit of overlap with that as well. But we're looking for them for, to be eighteen to twenty five when they join 
their placements. And again, in July, just like the Darwin Mentor Programme, we're going to be opening up um, the application process for those. But to be really clear, what we're looking for isn't just people interested in vaguely interested in conservation. We're looking for people that have already done amazing things, especially okay. by their own energy, gone out against the odds, against any kind of help, just gone out there and done incredible things to help make the world better. It doesn't matter whether they've been to university. It doesn't matter whether they've been to Oxford or Harvard. That's irrelevant. It doesn't even matter whether they can read or write. It's about the ability to go out there make the world a better place and help save yeah ecosystems wildlife animals plants etc so that'll be that'll be on the website in july thank you <laughs> cool. any other any other questions no all righty well if everyone's happy um I guess we'll, we'll, we, we can call it there. Um, we warmly invite you to join the next session, which is the first day of every month at the same time, just to keep it easy. We, we keep it the same time on the first day of every month. So it's super easy to remember. Um, every month we do different content as, as Gerben kindly mentioned, the previous one was about the history of the vessel. Um, every month we, we do different subjects and different overviews of the voyage and different Obviously, we'll be doing um, legs 9 to 16 next week. So we really hope you can join the next Q&A session. And we really hope you you choose to be part of, of the, the wonderful Buster Skill Days crew. And um, we hope to see you aboard. So thank you very, very much for joining. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a lovely week. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye, Bye all. Bye. Uh, have a lovely weekend. Bye. <laughs>